I always talk about customer experience. Why can't they have the same atmosphere when they go to wash their clothes that they have when they go to buy their iPhone? I taught my team how to be disruptors. Take my vision in my head, sit down with each employee and say, I need you to take this and run with them. Hey everyone, Dave Men's Laundromat Millionaire coming to you again from the beautiful city of Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> I know, Carla's laughing, but hey, <laughs> it's home for us. What can we say? We love Cincinnati. And we love visiting other places that are maybe a little bit more beautiful too. But anyway, we had a beautiful day yesterday, didn't we? I we mean, did. 73 degrees. Today, but... <laughs> yeah, it's pretty rainy today. So we should have maybe recorded this yesterday. <laughs> Anyways, we have another great episode for you. We have another, yes, you guessed it, another one of Dave's friends that's coming on the show. This guy is a rock star like very few in the industry. If you were at the conference, you've already gotten to know him a little bit. Uh, but we're going to tell his story because his story is unique. It's uh, we all, all of our stories are unique, and there is a ton of content, education, lessons. Um, so get out those pads of paper and take some notes. Carla, you want to introduce our guest? Yes. So I'm excited to introduce our guest today. He is Steve Andrews. He is a devoted Christian, a husband, a father, and an owner of Wash House Laundromats in Nashville, Tennessee. So Steve, welcome to our show. Hey guys, how are y'all? Good, good. If you if you didn't know he's from Nashville, now you do because he just said, <laughs> "How are y'all?" And that's how they roll down there. There's nothing yeah, there's, like a good Southern drawl. <laughs> there's not a lot of us uh, natural-born Nashvillians anymore. Yeah, so. <laughs> Nashvillians. That's a mouthful. Wow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Listen, Nash man. Vegas to some. So. <laughs> Listen, thanks for joining us today, man. I have been wanting to do this for a long time, and I knew you had so much going on. So I was like, well, maybe I'll let him, you know, get this new store open and things like that. And then we can talk yeah. about not just number one, but two. And I know you're working on number three. So there's just, uh, man, you've been in the business, what, three, three and a half years, something like that. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Seems three. like a millennia. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, guys, you're going to want to pay attention here because one of the big misnomers that I see in here in this industry, why I wanted to have Steve on this show, is that you can't be a leader in this industry and you can't know too much or have anything to give back unless you've been in the industry 20, 30, 40 years. And we're not here to discredit those people, the old, the old timers, the legends, the veterans that have blazed trails. They have a lot to teach us. So we're not, it's not an either or proposition, but I want to put Steve forward today on this show. And I want to show you how quickly someone can become a rock star in this industry. And what are the attributes? What are the things that's made Steve so successful in a short period of time? And by the way, he's going to continue to tell me that he's not because he's so humble. And that's one of the character traits that allows you to be a true rock star. Um, so anyway, Steve, can you just real quickly, let's dive right into it. Tell us about your childhood. Um, did you, you said you're a Nashvilleian. So did you grow up right. in Nashville? I did. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I probably live only about three miles away from where my parents brought me home from the hospital. Wow. So you're less well-traveled than me. <laughs> yeah. Now there's some times where I spent away from this area, but I just always came back. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I pretty much lived a, a fairly charmed uh, lifestyle when I was a kid. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was young, however, but I, I still grew up in a good, strong Christian family and, and that really kind of built my my level of ethics. But my father was always a really a strong influence in my life from a standpoint of just pushing me. Uh, he could he could always tell that there was potential there. And he would always tell me, you know, you can you can do whatever the heck you want to do as long as you work hard. And unfortunately, it feels like nowadays that's a trait that a lot of people have kind of forgotten. We can we can talk about staffing a little bit later, but um, <laughs> yeah, he just he just always pushed me when it came to sports, when it came to life. Uh, all along the way, I could see his example of being good to other people at the same time. So mm -hmm. work hard, work your butt off, give back when and where you can. And, and that just really had a big impact on me. Um, my grandfather was a Nazarene pastor. My uncle is a retired pastor. My cousin now pastors the church that uh, my grandfather pastored. So hmm. 
it's always been in my family and, and prayer and, and leading a life that would be uh, befitting to Jesus is really just kind of how I follow every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I went off to college and I initially thought, yeah, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to make a lot of money one day. And <laughs> so I was a double major in college, biology and chemistry. And that was just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I have no clue what the heck I was thinking. And uh, so eventually I ended up graduating with just a degree in biology. And of course, you know, that always leads you directly to, to laundromats. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, uh, I spent a little bit of time in Red Lodge, Montana. Montana. My, uh, my mom lived out there. And so I spent some time with her. And I was really just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Once I figured out I wasn't going to be a doctor. Um, came back and got my first corporate job actually in the t- uh, telecom world spent some time at bell south you're familiar with the bells mm-hmm. um and then moved into healthcare, which if you're in nashville is the the big industry here. yeah that's huge right oh it's massive yeah and you, you know there's a lot of things about healthcare that are great but there's a lot that's really bad i know a lot of people can can agree with that so I spent a number of years in operations management, actually managed a team upwards of 85 people at one point. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> then did a lot of client management, sales, things like that. I enjoyed the job. I would just sit at my desk sometimes and, and look out the window and think, man, it sure would be nice to be out there doing my own thing. I would, I would drive past stores and I'd say, oh, look, those guys have a lighting store. I could do a lighting store, <laughs> right? You know, who, who wants to do lighting? <laughs> so anyway, I think the entrepreneurial spirit was always inside of me. It was just a matter of finding the right opportunity to make it fit. And so I spent about 17 years in the corporate world and one of my good friends, uh, J.D. Dixon, he's been on your show as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, J.D.'s a distributor here in Nashville with uh, National Laundry Equipment. Um, he came to my son's birthday party. His wife and my wife are actually really good friends. And I got to talking to him. He's like, man, you should look at this laundry thing. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Why would I want to do that? That's ridiculous. And then... I instantly. And that was the end. It was over. Yeah. You got right. JD. You got JD Dixon in Nashville talking about laundromats. That's like getting Dave Menz to talk about laundromats. Oh man, and that guy <laughs> is full of knowledge. He is. I, awesome. I give him tons and tons of credit for where I'm at today. I still have to take him out for dinners every so often just to pay him back. Mm-hmm. But I I sat down and I really started researching stuff. And at the time, this was only four years ago, what you're doing, what Jordan's doing, what a lot of these, some of these other guys are doing, that stuff wasn't out there, Mm -hmm. even just four years ago. So there was a few things here and there on YouTube. Uh, Shout out to Ken Barrett, Mm -hmm. saw some of his stuff. And I would watch YouTube videos of all of these laundromats. And then I went out around town and started walking into them and seeing what was out there. And part of my job when I was in the corporate world was to take a process and improve upon it, make it better, better results, more efficient, better uh, cost savings, things like that. And I just looked at laundry mats and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I, of opportunity I can for that. <laughs> yes. I can make a big difference here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, You know, they talk about in the startup world, always getting in and disrupting the market. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I had in my mind to to do. How did that opportunity appear to you? What did you see or did JD help you? Well, I'm sure he helped you see it. What did you see that was just so glaringly obvious when it comes to opportunity? Well, if you've heard me talk at all anywhere, I always talk about customer experience. Mm. And the customer experience, when you walk into any of these, well, I shouldn't say all of them. There are a lot of really good operators, a lot Mm -hmm. of really good laundromats around the country. There's some in Nashville. 
but there are some that are just they're the zombie man Mm -hmm. and in my head i couldn't grasp the fact that someone couldn't go into a laundromat where they want to get their clothes clean and it just be utterly nasty why why can't they have the same atmosphere when they go to wash their clothes that they have when they go to buy their iphone Mm. you know there's no reason why they can't have that so my idea was to just really input a nice atmosphere with, you know, I enjoyed the design part of it, to be honest with you, laying the laundry out, picking the colors, picking the finishes, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm thinking, if I walk into this place, how is it going to make me feel? Mm -hmm. Because I kind of have high expectations when I go into certain places. And there's no reason why my customers shouldn't either. Mm -hmm. Are you renovating your store or building a new one? Tired of persistent and expensive plumbing issues like I was? Get an HM Company drain trough to give those drain lines a fighting chance against the constant wear and tear of laundromat life. Sizing is fully customizable to meet your needs and lead times are a maximum of two weeks. I've used them in my stores in Cincinnati for years and I'm installing them in my new store which is opening soon. Visit their website today at draintroughs.com and contact your distributor to order your drain trough today. How was JD a part of that? When you told him, I want to build the uh, Taj Mahal of laundromats, was he more thinking of it uh, through a functional lens, which is a lot of good distributors do, by the way, they just see, you know, layout and washers and dryers. And a lot of times their strength isn't design and things like that. Right. Well, so JD and I are a little bit different. I'm a little more aesthetic focused, but he's put together a team that understands that part of it too. Mm, okay. um, my my sales guy, his name is John Pell. And John is spectacular when it comes to that stuff. I mean, one of the first things he told me was, Steve, you got to have nice wide open aisles. You got to have space for people to breathe, places to sit, plenty of folding. You don't want something where we've crammed in a hundred machines into 2000 square feet. He's like, you're just, you're going to get a lot of activity, but you're, you're not going to give your customers the kind of experience that I hear Mm -hmm. you saying you're looking for. So um, JD and John I will, I will say I listened to about 95% of what they said Mm -hmm. and they were right on every single bit of it. Uh, It's almost all the way down to the point to where John said, okay, Steve, if we open this store here, your customers are going to primarily come from this area right over here. Mm -hmm. And as I surveyed my customers, when they were coming in, they're like, oh, we live right over here. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, can you, they, re- they hit can you real quick point. quickly share that share that wisdom with us? I know we don't have visuals, but what was it he was looking at? I know demographics. That's like what everybody yeah. says, right? Yeah. So literally, he could tell you there are five large apartment complexes right over here. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in the area where we put our first store, we had about fifty percent renters in the area, so it was mm-hmm. a heavy renter area, mm-hmm. which creates obviously good demogra- demographics. Uh, But yeah, he would say everybody in these apartment complexes have to drive past you to get to the interstate. Mm. (laughs) Hear that? Hear that, everybody? It's not just about demographics. It's not just about that people are there. It's where are people? Yeah. What are traffic patterns and things like that? That's powerful. That's great advice. And he also, as we were looking at the building, he said, Steve, I love the site we really got have to replace these windows. They're they small, skinny windows. And he's like, let's get some big, bold windows in there. And then we're going to put your big, high capacity machines right there. So as people drive by, they mm-hmm. can see, oh, they have plenty of space for me to go there. Mm-hmm. Um, they also really hammered me on upfront parking. Mm-hmm. Um, you really don't want a situation where your customers are having to carry their basket across a busy road that's in front of a strip center or, or wherever you're at. Um, but this allowed people to just walk right in. Um, they really pushed me on automatic doors. Um, 
And John even pushed me a little bit further than what I was comfortable when it came to selecting the machines. So I use HIPS machines in my stores and HIPS comes with a number of different kind of uh, color palettes mm -hmm. that you could choose for the machine covers. And he's like, Steve, go with the green. The Citron is awesome. He's like, it's really going to stand out against the stainless steel. Stainless steel. And I was like, eh, I don't know, man. I kind of like this gray. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, we'll do it. So we put the green in in there. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, I love this green. <laughs> and so now green is a big part of our overall branding. Mm -hmm. I mean, we put it on our, our van now. It's in on our walls as accent colors. It's in our logo. So it really, you know, that all comes from my distributor. I'm always telling people how vitally important having a rock star launder or uh, equipment distributor is. And then I don't think we as an industry do a good enough job of doing two things. One, teaching people how to find them, which some of us kind of stumble into, you and I did, right? right. But there is kind of an art to it if you don't stumble into it. But I'm more, more important than that, I'm curious, how do you see his team? Because I always tell people, with an equipment, there are good equipment distributors out, distributors out there that are just a person. And then there are good equipment distributors out there that are a team. And mm -hmm. I know JD is both, but I'm, I don't know his story exactly, but I'm guessing he started as him and then he's built a team, just as I encourage people like you and I to build a team within our organization. We're the leader, but we have to build people around us. And I think right. that's a sign of a rock star distributor. So I guess what I would ask you is you've gotten to know JD pretty well. Ultimately, the question is, how does he look at the team? And do you know how he's built that team? I'm curious the story behind that. Yeah, so he and John Pell have been together for a number of years. I think almost from the beginning, mm -hmm. JD decided he was going to buy this distributorship and he reached out to John because he knew him personally and knew oh, kind okay. of what his work ethic was, you know, kind of how he, I guess, you know, went about his day to day. Mm -hmm. And, and they, those two do, together have really kind of learned everything. And over time, I mean, between the two of them, the knowledge there is just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and then he kind of takes approach to put people in areas where their expertise is. So in other words, John really focuses on the sales area of it. He's mm -hmm. a very personable person, a, you know, someone who you can get along with. Um, he knows the equipment. He knows all the, the aesthetics of building a store. Uh, and then he also has a team of uh, repairmen, uh, that type thing. And he's got a manager that manages those guys as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a little bit more kind of behind the scenes as far as that goes. Um, I, I, I talk to him a lot because, uh, unfortunately, I'm a pretty heavy customer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think JD's done a good job of, of building a team that can focus on the different areas of a customer for him. Mm. So when it comes to starting a store, then when it comes to maintaining the store, um, and then he's, he's kind of my guru. You talk about your distributor being kind of your guru. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I've got some wild and crazy idea in my head, other than my wife, he's one of the first people I call mm -hmm. and, and like, Hey JD, I'm thinking about this am I crazy? You know, what do you, what do you think about this? What's your feedback? And, you know, he's a good sounding board for me. Mm, man, that's a, that's a powerful one. I think that's really important and a great, you know, an equipment distributor doesn't have to be a great mentor, right. but the great equipment distributors typically are, if that makes sense. It doesn't make you a bad distributor if you're not a good mentor, but having that sounding board and quite frankly, you mentioned it and I have too, more than one, having multiple great sounding boards can can really put us on the right trajectory to success. All right, so let's dig back into your store for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about the process of building your store because I, I, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the details at the moment. We've talked so much over the years <laughs> um, and I talked to so many people over the years, but I do know you had some significant hiccups in building your store. Um, walk us through Both that process. Them, actually. <laughs> walk okay walk us through the process of building let's let's just isolate the first store for now walk us through the process of building that store and the hiccups you ran into because didn't you have like a three or four month 
just oh, it was, craziness. Yeah. It was painful at certain points. Mm. Um, so it started out, I had identified a location that I really liked. Um, it was a little bit smaller than where I'm actually at. Um, it was actually a former Jack in the Box location. And it was right on the road, good up front parking, um, a really good spot to be. The landlord still had an ongoing lease with Jack in the Box. And it was about to run out, I think in about 10 months or so, but she was still generating a decent income from it. And so we were trying to convince her to let us sign a new lease. Hey, look, we're looking at 10 years with two five-year options, 20 years in the bank, solid business. And we just couldn't get her to budge off of waiting that 10 months to, uh, she was making pretty good bank on that Jack in the Box lease. <laughs> So we had to look elsewhere because my timeline was much faster than 10 months. As a matter of fact, the corporate job that I was in, I had left uh, because I was ready to jump into this wholeheartedly. And so from a cash flow perspective, I needed to uh, get to some cash flow. So you left your job before you even started the process of building your first store. Because that's yes. definitely that's definitely a little uh, inordinate. Was there a reason for that? Uh huh. There sure was. Um, God. <laughs> hey, there's not a better reason that I know of. <laughs> and then I say that kind of tongue in cheek because it wasn't my timing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my cor my corporate job, they actually had eliminated my position. And so they came to me and said, hey, look, uh, we've got some other spots over here. If you'd like to move over here. And I was like, nope, um, give me the package and I'll, I'll go ahead and take my leave now. I was ready to go. Okay. So luckily the package assisted for some of that cash flow time frame. But I didn't have a location yet and obviously has not put a shovel in the ground. So it was a little bit stressful for me and for, and for Rachel, my wife. Um, so this first location fell through and again, JD comes through for me and he says, Steve, why don't you come check out this spot over here? Uh, so I go over there. It's uh, three businesses all in one standalone business or one standalone building, the daycare on the front, a barber shop, and then like a little office building in the back, about 4,700 square feet total. And he's like, Steve, this spot, is unbelievable trust me and and this is this will tell you what kind of guy jd is he said steve i've been looking at this spot to open my own laundry but i think it would be perfect for you and i was like jd no <laughs> i was like man if you're planning on doing this you do this you do it here well, i'll find another spot he's like man you're my customer you come first let's put you in here and dear Lord, did he put me into a honeypot mm -hmm. because it absolutely was that. Unfortunately, we struggled to get it open and it wasn't his fault. Um, we used a contractor that he had actually used before. Uh, and we really liked them, liked them because of the project man manager. And he quit about two weeks into the project. <laughs> Wow. So we had to kind of reassess with the existing contractor and they just didn't have anyone who was ready to manage it the same way. So it took us about nine months to do the build out. Um, yeah, it was painful. So I was already paying rent. Um, I, my wife and I owned a couple of rental properties personally and sold those to help uh, pay our lifestyle. And, you know, we were, we were all in at this point. As a matter of fact, I even used a Rob's, are you familiar with Rob's, to finance the project. I am. Can you super oh, quickly Rob's explain Rob's. to our audience what that is? Or, okay, explain to yeah. Carlos. <laughs> explain to me. I don't know. So it's, I'm not sure what the yes stands for, but it's a rollover, rollover business 401k loan of sorts. Right. So you essentially take funds that you've saved up in a 401 account, 
Uh, typically, it's in a rollover rollover account, and you sell whatever you have, whatever uh, assets you own in that four hundred one k, and you buy stock in your company. So essentially, now my four hundred one k owns stock in my business, okay. which it has to be set up a certain way, has to be a C corp. Um, I have to offer a 401k to my employees. Um, and then there's annual filing that has to occur as well. Um, it's, it's a very legal process. It's a very, it's in, I don't know how to describe this, but it's a very specific part of the IRS code that allows you to do it. So you could literally use your retirement funds to, to start a business business and you don't pay any fees or taxes or any of those things. Would you do the Robs over again? I mean, obviously you've had success. So anytime we've had success, we always look and say, well, why wouldn't I do that again? But yeah. I guess what I, I guess my question is for people that are considering doing it, at least in my mind, like the alternative is cash out the money, take the hit, and then you don't have the, and I might be making this up in my mind, then you don't have to go through, you do have pay, you do pay that penalty. So you lose some of your funds, but then you don't have the cumbersome process of one, setting it up to managing it ongoing, things like that. Or are those things just not a big deal? They're not a big deal. Okay. Um, I use a company called Guidant, mm -hmm. uh, Guidant Financial, and they manage most everything when it comes to getting the paperwork together, both in the beginning and ongoing. Um, the only thing that's a little frustrating is it having to be a C corp. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, I am literally a W two employee of my company. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of double taxing, yeah. but um, you know, so ideally it would be better if it was set up in an LLC. I'd say if you're looking at, Hey, I have all this capital over here that I can start a business with, or I have this 401k that I can go start a business with. I would use the capital instead. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be the only uh, kind of battle, I think, in that case. But if I'm looking at a Rob's versus taking the hit, the taxes mm -hmm. and everything, I would definitely choose Rob's. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So let's dig back into your store for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about the process of building your store. One of our biggest struggles in opening the first store was, like I said, it was a daycare before a barbershop and an office. Uh, so we didn't have any of the utilities. Mm -hmm. We needed water, we needed gas, and a bigger electric board. Um, getting the water was the toughest part. Um, I Part of the problem with my contractor was that I was personally responsible for all of the permitting, which I am not a permitting expert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so unfortunately, that was a struggle. Um, it took us literally about three months to get our water meter installed and approved. Um, I still have the vid video from when I turned on that first machine and water started rolling in. It was a uh, hallelujah moment. Tear running um, down your cheek. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so one of the, the frustrating things was they told us from the site plan that the water line was in the middle of the road. So in order for us to tap into it, we're going to, have to cut into the road. We're going to have to have, you know, a flagger and it was going to be extremely expensive. So I had called 411, which, uh, you know, they come out and mark all the utilities, utilities. And they called me and said, okay, we marked it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to drive up here and see what we're looking at. Uh, as we're, as I turn right at the red light, I literally am saying a prayer in my head, please, dear Lord, somehow have this be where it will work out. And as I drive onto my property, the lines for the water line are in my front yard, not in the road. Nice. Saved me about $20,000. And when funds were tight, mm -hmm. that was a huge blessing. So, yeah. Um, but we finally got open. Uh, as soon as I turned on the open sign, 
people literally with less than 30 many 30 minutes were flowing in wow. and haven't stopped since so it's uh it was it was a lot of fun it was a struggle i learned a ton <laughs> and uh it was it was really special for my family and it's changed our lives what was the process of owning a laundromat now you've built one but you are a new laundromat owner. Did, were you in there constantly running it? Did no, he just shows off? up and collects like, the quarters. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's, that's what the does. YouTube video <laughs> says. Uh, um, no, that's a wonderful question. And sometimes I let my wife answer that because <laughs> as soon as I opened, as I mentioned, you know, we were getting from a capital perspective pretty tight. So I couldn't hire a team. I was the team. So for the first 96 days that we were open, I worked every single day, usually 10 hour days. And while I wouldn't necessarily recommend that someone do it that way, um, if you're a knucklehead like I am, sometimes you have to do stuff, screw it up, and then you learn. And that's pretty much what I did during those first 96, 96 days. Um, it allowed me to get in, learn the business. I, and, and honestly, the most fun part about this whole business is meeting the people. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet a ton of people, even those that I didn't speak the same language as. Um, and I'm slowly improving my Spanish. But it really allowed me to learn the community learn where they were from, what they do. Uh, and, and I actually have a lot of friends that were my customers first. And I still see them in there. We talk about their kids. We talk about my kids. And it's, it's really an awesome thing to be a part of building something essentially from the ground up that you have people who rely on you every single week. Mm. it's it that's just awesome <laughs> okay so you were the you were a one-man show for 96 days not that you were yeah. counting but 96 exactly yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay so how did you evolve from there into balancing okay i have enough revenue to start to build a team and mm. what were those core components and what did that look like because i'm not sure that you know, we could sit here and tell stories of building laundromats and water problems forever and ever. And I do think that's very helpful. But let's be honest, I think one of the biggest problems in our industry with operators that we all struggle with, us included, is building a team, but then managing a team. Yeah. Yeah, I agree a million percent. The first thing I did when I decided it was time to hire a team was I literally just put a sign up on my front desk and said, now hiring. And my first, I would say probably six or seven employees were all customers. Mm. Um, and I spent the time with them. As soon as I hired them, I would sit down with them and I told them my story. Mm -hmm. I told them my history. I told them, I, I'm always up front with people and tell them I'm a Christian. Number one, because that's what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I want them to know kind of where my mindset's coming from. But I would explain to them, hey, look, there we are right in the middle. I don't think I said this earlier, but we are right in the middle of seven other laundromats within a two-mile radius. Wow. So our customers have a lot of options. Mm-hmm we have to set ourselves apart and how are we going to do, do how are we going to do that well, number one it's going to be about the atmosphere right well, i talked about that earlier and i put great machines in there i made it nice open and airy now it's your job to ensure that it's clean um people are uh, see your smile when they come inside and that they know you I mean, I smile whenever I hear the change machine and all the coins drop. That's great, right? I love that. Have to have it. But I smile even more 
when a customer walks in the door and one of my employees greets them by name. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, that's it right there. That's what you want. And we had so many people come into our store and say, we come to see you because of your employees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. You don't want to come see this mug. You know, let's go see them. <laughs> and it, it just really makes all the difference in the world. Um, essentially, I was able to take my vision in my head, sit down with each employee and say, I need you to take this and run with them. Now, does everybody do that? No, <laughs> unfortunately, they don't. But I had a few right from the beginning that really did. They, I, would, I showed them what I had learned during those 96 days of how to clean, um, how to treat people, how to take care of the machines, how to just deal with problems that pop up. And they would take what I taught them and expand on it. So I would come in one day and they would be doing something totally different to the way I showed them how to do it. And I'd be like, hey, so why are you guys doing this like this? Oh, well, you know, we do it because of blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it, it just really was important that that whole vision I told you in the beginning about disrupting the market mm -hmm. that I taught them how to be disruptors. I taught my team how to be disruptors so that they don't take any experience that they had going into a laundromat before and bring that here. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the whole thought process when we opened our second store was let's pick up what we have right here and let's mm -hmm. put it over here. That's and, the beauty of that's the beauty of building something that is fantastic and that serves the industry is then you can scale it. Way yeah. too many way, way too many people get that cart before the horse and they try to scale and then reverse engineer. And I always tell them build build that first one and and figure out your model. Doesn't have to be perfect. You'll always be evolving, but figure out the baseline for what your company is going to be which is typically based on your integrity and your character and your faith and all these different things that go into making us who we are. And then build a team around a core team is what I always say. And that can be one person or three or 10. And then you know how to replicate it. You know what that looks like. Cause you just made that sound pretty simple, but we, you and I all <laughs> both know it's not simple. Uh, it's not simple right. at all. And, and I'll add this too. coming up in the corporate world. I saw a lot of leaders who, as they would go from leadership position to leadership position, they always had a right-hand person that would move along with them. Mm -hmm. and, and so I learned early, I need to find people that who could potentially become my right-hand person mm -hmm. and try and groom those folks, you know, tell them what I'm thinking about why I'm doing something. You know, I would explain to them, okay, hey guys, girls, um, we need to raise our prices and here's why we're doing it. Um, gas prices are increasing, water prices are increasing, um, you know, whatever it is, explain to them my thought process for everything that I was doing to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some things they don't need to know the insides out, um, but the things that were key to what they were doing day to day, I needed them to understand why. And some people would just take that and just, okay, all right, whatever. But then I had a couple that just took it and like really, you know, put it on their brain and let that guide them every single day. Mm -hmm. So I had two employees that started out as part-time, um, to a Hispanic lady. So they're bilingual, which is an added mm -hmm. bonus. Yeah. And th they just loved what they were doing. And I made sure that I treated my employees with respect. I understood that sometimes life happened and I could try and be respectful of, the, of that. And I tried to reward them every time I possibly could. 
And so I had two employees specifically that really grew in that model. And now one of them is the store manager of that first store. And the other one is the store manager of the new, the new store. Mm-hmm. So, and then I, I always knew I wanted to grow this thing, but I knew this guy can't do it by himself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, How so that did- was kind of my mindset in building the team. Go ahead, Carla. What is your current management structure then? Do you have, so it's you on top and then do you just have the two store managers and then employees under that or are there any other levels? Yeah, that's pretty much it for right now. Um, As we add, looking at add a third store, Mm -hmm. then I'll start to look at a general manager position that kind of manages above all and would take a little bit more of my responsibilities. But in each store, we have a store manager and we don't have a set like assistant manager or a a team lead. Um, We kind of have what I call key employees in each one of those stores. So these are the people that I know that I can communicate with directly. Mm -hmm. If the manager is unavailable or if they're on vacation that I can count on to pick up the slack. And they're essentially my bench for future growth. Mm-hmm. So um, I have to make sure that as long as the managers are, are performing, which I don't doubt that they ever will not do that. <laughs> I take care of them and I take care of that bench. What kind of tasks do your store managers, like what all are they responsible for and what do you still do yourself? So the managers today are responsible for all, obviously the day-to-day running of the store itself. Uh, they manage the employees. They manage schedules. Um, we they manage all the drop off. Um, at my new store was where we do our pickup and delivery, and we have uh, our larger commercial clients up there, uh, and we we do all that work at that store because it's larger, and we have ozone there. Um, but she manages all the day to day operation of of those things as well to ensure things running smoothly. Um, my day-to-day typically involves obviously anything dealing with the money. Um, there are times where I trust my managers to manage some of the money pieces if, if I'm unavailable or my wife is unavail- unavailable. Um, but for the most part, I'm taking care of uh, growing the team, uh, marketing, um, sales to a certain extent. Um, and just kind of generating the overall vision for our growth and future. And then, yeah, I do collect the coins. We could talk about card versus coin too, (laughs) Um, because obviously with scale, you're going to have to have more efficient processes when it Mm -hmm. comes to dealing with coins. What is your pay? What are your payment systems in your stores right now? Are you just coin? No. So we're hybrid. Okay. So in our first store, we opened up, with fast card. Okay. So we take coins, quarters and fast card, loyalty, credit card, debit. Um, in the new store in, uh, Madison, we do coin. We're hybrid there too. Uh, but we're hybrid with, uh, hips command. Okay. Uh, I wanted, I wanted to try out a little different system. Um, I like the fast card system a lot, especially from a reporting standpoint. It's mm-hmm. really robust. Um, I just wanted to see kind of what another option would look like. And then as we grow, we'll kind of consolidate in one. I'm not mm-hmm. sure which one that will be yet, but. Can you real quickly for, for somebody that's not familiar with fast card or the hip uh, command, can you really mm-hmm. expl- explain the differences other than just obviously different companies? Yeah. So with fast card, fast card actually installs readers on every single machine. So it's a credit card reader. It's a touch card or a touch point screen. And you can use your credit card, debit card, or a fast card loyalty card. So we do utilize the loyalty program, which uh, gives all of our customers for every $30 they spend, they get three bonus dollars, uh, which is kind of like an added little bonus to to keep them coming back. But uh, they can put money on their fast card, either with cash or the credit card. There's also a mobile app that comes along with it so that you can use the app to start the machines. 
So it's a, it's a pretty high tech thing. And that was really what I wanted to make sure we were a part of when it comes to that whole customer experience. I mean, a lot of the laundries that I went in in this area really didn't even have credit card readers, much less a loyalty program. Um, but the main difference between HIPS and FastCart is that you have the readers on the machines. With the HIPS command system, there's actually a system that's inside of the machine so that there's no readers externally. Uh, if a customer wants to use HIPS command, there's a payment center kiosk and they can go to that kiosk and pay with a credit card there or a debit card, um, or they can use a little uh, HIPS uh, fob, uh, I guess is the best description for it. Um, or there's even an app for HIPS command as well, where they don't have to go to the payment center. They can just stand at the machine, punch in their number and start it from there. Um, and both systems give me as an owner a lot of controls over not only just knowing what's happening with the machines, but allows me to start and stop machine, uh, allows me to go in and reverse or fast forward to different cycles. Um, it'll even, the HIPS command cycle or HIPS command system will even tell me uh, drain times or fill times so that I can see if a machine might have a potential drain blockage or having some issue with a valve and really allows you to control more remotely, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, nice. which is great. And plus I can tell at any point in time at that second, how much from a revenue perspective we're doing, how many turns per day we're doing. Um, you know, a lot of the key you know, demographic things that you need to know to run your day to day. Fantastic. All right. So we can't let you go without talking about pickup and delivery, Steve, because <laughs> I am looking at, and I already know what this is. It's hard to, it's hard to, uh, to interview somebody when you know the answers to half the questions, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> uh, luckily I, don't have, do. <laughs> luckily I don't have a very good memory, so I don't remember a lot of the answers. <laughs> All right. So tell me about this map behind you and not the details. Just tell me, Oh yeah, that's, that is your service area. Uh, real quickly. Tell us about that. And keep yeah. in mind, keep in mind, some people are uh, are not are only listening on audio. Sure, sure. So this is a essentially a map of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, you can see a lot of little red dots here and there. Mm -hmm. um, those those are, are actually those are where you're going to have stores someday, right? <laughs> well, they're all the other laundry mats in town. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Good yeah. Time. So I have. You can see there's a bunch. Yeah. And then these these black circles are. I think five, no, three mile radius outside of the center, which is where my store is. Very, very so, nice. um, and underneath each store, I have demographics for that store. So I can kind of see from an area perspective, you know, where the good potential for stores could be. And again, I look at population, renter percentage, you know, a few other different things. Mm -hmm. um, but then this also has zip codes so that I can look by zip code how many customers we have when it comes to pickup and delivery specific. Mm -hmm. And that can kind of tell me either it's a good area or a bad area. Um, we just recently switched to the Scent system, mm -hmm. which allows you to do some on-demand pickup and delivery. And so that's something I'm exploring pretty heavily right now, trying to decide if we want to roll that out. Mm -hmm. And part of that is from a cost perspective, because obviously pickup and delivery costs can be pretty extensive if you don't manage them very acutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure the Carla, they, you know that very <laughs> we <know>. well. <laughs> we do. And, and every single lever when it comes to those costs can change your profit margin drastically. Mm -hmm. So if gas goes up a dollar, that's going to hurt. If you all of a sudden, you know, have to buy a new vehicle, then that's going to be a cost that's going to imp impact you or hire a new employee, whether it be a processing employee or a driver. Um, you need to make sure that you understand all those levers and how they impact your bottom line to, to make those decisions. But this map 
really allows me to figure out where are the best areas to attack and what are some to stay away from. Because we made the mistake in the beginning by taking on too much of an area. Uh, area. Because for pickup uh, we and delivery? Were, Is that what you yeah, mean? for pickup yeah. and delivery specifically, yeah. mm -hmm. because we were driving hundreds of miles. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we really hadn't grown to a, to a point to where it, it made sense. Now, in my head, the thought process was, let's just get it out there. Let's, let's get a few points, and then we'll fill in the rest over time. And so what we learned was some areas don't fill in. <laughs> some do. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to know, well, it's really, I guess I should really say, it's really important to be okay with cutting bait mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you need to. And that's a tough decision because in some of these areas where we would have like, you know, we're over here, like one person, that was a great customer. Mm -hmm. They would usually send us 40, 50 pounds every week. Mm -hmm. but it just, it wasn't filling in around it. Uh, so that just really kind of told me there probably wasn't a big demand for pickup and delivery in that area. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a learning experience for sure. And I think the biggest learning point that I had was definitely knowing the geography and this map helps me do that because I'm visual. Mm -hmm. I could look at it on a computer all day long but I can take my pen and draw on it. It makes me feel like I'm doing something, you know? <laughs> Old school. Well, you know, yeah. something I want to, something I want to point out is a few minutes ago, we were talking about what the structure of your team looks like. And we were talking about that these employees do this and these do this. And then you kind of glazed, glossed over it real quickly. And you were like, and I do like all the visual, the vision and the growth and the future type of stuff. And I think a lot of times we, as business owners, we, th like we throw that into a category of like, it kind of sounds like a bunch of fluff where you're not really doing anything. <laughs> right. But, but for, I mean, I mean, for somebody that hasn't done it, that doesn't understand that that's work. And you it, just oh, real yeah. quickly with just a small segment of your business broke down some of that hypothesis, some of that, what you spend your time doing of drilling down on individual zip codes and this could apply to self-serve with demographics and mm -hmm. where your competitors lie and all these different things what people that are either not in the business or entering the business or new to the business need to understand is if you're not spending time doing those things then that most likely means no one is right and if no one is and you wonder why your company isn't growing then it's because you're spending too much time whatever it is you're doing, driving the van, fixing machines, being an attendant, processing laundry. And don't get me wrong, on a day-to-day -day basis, we do what we have to do. But right. on a month-by-month -month or year-by-year -year basis, if you aren't the visionary of your business making this strategic decisions, then typically no one is. And so you have to find a way over time to build a core team around you that frees you up to allow you to do those things because they're not things we gloss over real quickly they're yeah. quite frankly, some of the most important decisions we make. Um, and it's always like that highest and best use of time that so many business strategists talks about, you know, what's the best use of Steve Andrews time within his organization? Is it driving a van or doing laundry? Or is it making strategic decisions on whether we even take a van to that zip code? Right? Well, I don't think we as small business owners, I don't think we spend the time to process that enough. So I think that I just wanted to call attention to that because that's a big part of your success is that the first 96 days you did what you had to do. And every day you still do what you have to do that day, but it's always with that thing in the back of your mind. And as we've been friends and I've gotten to know you and you've called me on occasions and different things like that, I've heard and seen and walked through those wheels turning for you. And so a part of having you on the show, Steve, is to show people how much you've accomplished in a very short period of time, but it's equally as important to show them how you accomplish those things. And I just didn't want to run over that real quickly. Yeah, I think the best way for someone to really kind of immerse themselves in this business is to just, I, I, I sometimes I have a hard time deciding, do I enjoy being an entrepreneur, just owning my own business? 
Mm. Or do I just love the laundry business? And while one sounds a little ridiculous, right? Like, mm-hmm. why do you love the laundry business? Mm-hmm. Uh, the other, not so much. But what I've come to understand is that it's both. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I love owning my own business, but I love the fact that my business is the laundry mat business because there's so much opportunity to, mm-hmm. like, I mean, you say it a million times. You talk about elevating, elevating this industry. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's because it's got a lot of way, yep. a long way to go. Long way to go. That's right. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, at the conference, um, I forget the gentleman's name, but he talked a little bit about uh, commercial real estate. Mm-hmm. David, and, Cobb. David Cobb. Yeah, David yeah. Cobb. Oh, spectacular discussion. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that I would love to get to is for me to be able to call a potential real estate broker, someone who's leasing a building, and be able to talk to them about the fact that I want to open a laundromat in their in their building and then be like oh yeah mm-hmm. that would be great that's a great idea I explain love that explain what you mean by that because i suspect there's a good portion out there going wait that's not how this works <laughs> so <laughs> i i bet you i've made hundreds of calls uh, in my short time to real estate brokers who are leasing a building mm-hmm. and as soon as i dial the number there's always a little bit of anxiety that flows through me that says, as soon as I say laundromat, they're going to hang up on me mm-hmm. <laughs> because their first image is this dirty drab full of homeless people, you know, draws a bad element, element, low income people, you know, all this rough stuff. And to me, that's not really what this business Mm-mm. can be. Um, it, it's much more than that because I know the people that are utilizing our services and that's not those people. Mm-hmm. Are there a few bad apples? Sure. There's a few bad apples that walk into the Apple store, mm-hmm. you know? So there's no reason why we as a industry can take our stores to the next level and above mm-hmm. so that we as a group have more opportunity to grow. Uh, was it rising tide raises mm-hmm. all ships mm-hmm. uh, in this business? There's no doubt in my mind that what you're preaching is the absolute truth. And 10 years from now, we're going to have a ton of really savvy owners, a ton of really savvy investors who are in this business and can look at it from a perspective that's different than maybe historically the way it's been looked at. Mm-hmm. And that's going to allow everybody on the outside looking in to think, oh, yeah, that's a great business, you know, and it's not just going and collecting quarters. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let me tell you something. When you have your eyes on the vision of the future, like Steve Andrews does, then you can see those kings coming and you can create that like that becomes reality. Right. This isn't fiction. This is this is reality. This is what we are you know, creating in a day-to-day business, one laundromat at a time. It's actually why I stopped becoming so ambitious of going from one, two, three, four laundromats to five, 10, 15, 20, 30, which at one point was what I thought I was going to do with my life. And then I realized the opportunity and the platform that God had given me and Carla to be able to speak into and teach and motivate and inspire and show what I saw of the future of our industry. And I'm not claiming to be the only one, by the way, there's a whole bunch of us out there doing it. Steve Andrews is one of them. Um, But that's how we truly elevate an industry guys. And that's, if you're not spending time on vision and fortitude and team building and strategy and decision-making from us, from a, I don't know if sophisticated is the right word, because it's really not rocket science, but if you're not being intentional about these things, then they don't just happen arbitrarily. Yeah. And, And you know, what's interesting, sometimes there's stuff that you do and you think, oh, that's nothing. And it turns out to be something really big. Mm-hmm. And, and this industry is teaching me that in a lot of ways. So, and again, not patting myself on the back because I know better than that. But for example, this, our first store, and this is a high volume store, we have a new competitor. And again, we're in the middle of seven laundromats 
within the two mile radius. There's another new laundry coming in, probably about a mile and a half away and brand new, big store, new machines, all that good stuff. And I know they're coming. So I'm trying to prepare for that. Um, one of the things I was looking at every Sunday um, was my parking. So mm -hmm. I have a standalone building and we have 17 parking space, which is, should be plenty, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. Good problem to have, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I was again thinking like a customer. I literally would stand out there on a Sunday and watch my customers kind of work their way around the cars and park on the median and in the grass. And I was like, man, if I'm coming to this place, I'm not going to like that. Mm -hmm. So how can I make that better? Mm -hmm. So I spent a chunk of money to cut out a portion of a hill, build a retaining wall, repave my whole parking lot and added 11 new spaces. And I thought to myself, I'm just going to count that as the cost of doing business. You know, it's not really going to add anything to the bottom line. Once we did that, our numbers went up. I mean, my Sundays, I went from seeing, so we had 17 spots. I would see 22, 23 cars in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Now we're like almost 30 cars in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, how is that possible? The, uh, it, so it's the little thing, as long as you're thinking about the customer experience, that's always going to add back to your bottom line. Mm -hmm. Always. So, mm -hmm. especially in this business. There aren't too many things. I, I think, you know, we talk about location a lot. We talk about demographics a lot in our industry. We even are starting to talk about layouts and that more equipment doesn't mean more revenue. You know, better right. layout equals more revenue, more customers, happier customers equals we're starting to the narrative is shifting in that way. One of the things that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about and it sounds silly is the parking conversation because mm -hmm. we don't talk about it. And it's vitally important. Our customers are parking hogs. We want them <laughs> yeah. to be parking hogs, right? We want them to be in the spot. And that's one of the market differentiators um, in a modernized laundromat that I think yeah. is really hard to quantify. I don't know exactly what you spent on that, but I can hypothesize. And a chunk of change is probably a good way of putting it. And it would be real easy for someone who kind of already had their cake and was eating it too, to justify in their mind like we're already killing it. I don't need to do that. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things you just told me is your vision for always being better, yeah. always trying to find those ways to be better and not enough of us in the industry do that. And I don't think it's always from a bad place. I think it's a lot of times from a place of, they don't think they need to. Mm -hmm. And, and what I always like to challenge people with is maybe today you don't need to, but what if tomorrow you do? Yeah. What, right. what if yesterday you didn't have that new competitor and now you do? Because I recommend that people make decisions based on being proactive versus reactive. Don't wait for them to come in to do those things. Do those things so they won't come in. And that's yeah. a powerful business strategy. And that's something I didn't always know. I've kind of learned over the last three or four years myself. And, uh, you know, an investment in the future can sometimes be the best thing that you do of, of defending your territory, if we want to call it that or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, it, that's definitely 100% true. If you've got, like I said, 100 machine and 2000 square feet, people aren't going to go in there and use them. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how many are open, you know, they're just not comfortable there. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, listen, man, um, if you guys, if you guys weren't, if you didn't have the pleasure of being at the Laundromat Millionaire Conference in 2022, uh, which just ended shortly uh, a couple weeks ago, and we're recording this, uh, Steve was one of our panelists. Uh, he was he was on the panel of pickup and delivery. Absolutely knocked it out of the park. And I know Steve told us before he went online that he will absolutely be at the next uh, Laundromat Millionaire Conference. Uh, so if you guys are in the Nashville area, you can connect with Steve. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You're gonna be at the Clean Show. You're gonna be yeah, at the Clean Show. Awesome. That's the plan. All right. Clean show. Get the wifey July. to go with me. There you go. Nice. I'll yeah. get to meet her. Yes, that would yeah, be awesome. Absolutely, you should. We will be there. Me and Carla will be there. That would be awesome. Listen, man, before we let you go today, any last words of wisdom for uh laundromat owners out there, the future of the industry? And then of course, how can they how can they connect with you? No, um, 
Yeah, absolutely. If you want to connect with me, um, my email address is steve at washhouseclean.com. Um, or you can give me a shout. That's fine too. I always am getting numbers that I don't know. So I usually answer most every call. And a lot of times I have to talk to people who are trying to sell me Medicare. Which, you know, <laughs> I'm not eligible for Medicare. Uh, 615-500-6407. You know, I, I love talking about this business. Um, I'm, I'm again of the abundance mindset. Mm-hmm. So there's plenty to go around for all of us. And um, as far as like any like, you know, last minute thoughts or, you know, my motto, if you will, mm-hmm. um, I, this is my, I'll show you my mouse pad. So this is what I have to look at like every single day. And it's, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's backwards, but it no, says, go not- get it, go get it. As the, for those of you on audio, he's, it has his logo, the wash house and his logo and stuff. And it says, go get it in all capital letters. Yeah. So when I mouse around on my computer, go get it. Go get Don't it. be afraid. <laughs> well, if there's, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that I could, I've gotten to know Steve pretty well over the years. And it's an honor to call him my friend. And uh, you know, if there's, if there's, there's a bunch of reasons that I could point to Steve's success, but if I could point to one of them, it's his, it's his heart for servitude. And if you're tired of hearing me say that, then turn me off because I'm not going to stop, guys. I'm not going to stop. And if you don't have a heart for servitude, what I would encourage you to do is find a heart for servitude because that's still in your best interest. I'll add one more thing. and I'm sorry. No, go ahead. When you talk about servitude and we talk about building teams earlier mm-hmm. in this discussion, right. one of the things I am most proud of is those employees I talked about earlier. Uh, since they've started working with me, they have bought their first home. Mm-hmm. Um, one lady, she actually my manager at my new store, there was a school that was specific to her religion that was near our new store. And she really wanted her kids to go to this school. So it worked out perfectly that she could become the manager at this new store be able to take your kids every Mm. single day, pick them up every single day. And she sent me a picture, uh, a text of her and sorry, this kind of bugs me, Mm. but she sent me a picture of her waiting in line at the car line, car rider line Mm. to pick up her kids at school. And she's like, she wrote my dream. (laughs) I mean, come on. That's that's Guys, why you we, do it. We, thank you for pointing that out, Steve. When I talk about servitude, I mean it all encompassing, but I do tend to focus yeah. on the laundromat serving the community, meaning our customers, the people that come in. Servitude should envelop your entire business model if it's done correctly. And what Steve just talked about is another reflection of that. Yeah. Building a team where you're serving them. And your leaders, your if you build layers of management, they understand that their job as a GM is they are there to serve the people that work under them. And when you build a team and an organization with the heart of a servant, guys, that's almost uncompetable. Mm-hmm. It really is because very few people have an interest in doing that. And if they do have an interest in doing it, very few people are able to actually execute because it's it's not easy to do. It's something you have to get up every day and go get it. Like you really, really do. <laughs> That's right. You really do. Man. Wow. Thank you, Steve. I have been wanting to have you on for a while. And, uh, man, well, thanks knocked, for you, having me. I appreciate you knocked it, it out I, of the park. You knocked it out mm-hmm. of the park guys for everyone watching this episode. I think I said it in the beginning, but I'm going to say it again. Steve is one of the leaders of our industry. He is. It's a fact already. It's not, it's not, he's becoming a leader. He is one of the leaders of our industry by default because he chooses to behave in the way that he does run his business in that way. Listen, my friend, I'm going to let you get back to your work and your family, but thank you so much for being here today. Um, no, thank you, Dave. Appreciate I appreciate you. it. You guys are awesome. Appreciate what you're doing. Keep going. Uh, keep plugging through, man. You're making a difference. I promise. Thank you. We appreciate that, man. All right. Everyone at home, thanks for joining us today. I'll go ahead and say it. I know you're going to want to rewind this and watch it again because that dude right there is a rock star. 
And there's a ton of information, a ton of value, a ton of content that you're going to want to pull out of that to find your path forward for running your business with the heart of a servant. Guys, for Dave Menz in Cincinnati, Ohio, my beautiful wife, Carla, always alongside me, and my friend Steve Andrews in Nashville, we will see you guys next time for another episode of the Laundromat Millionaire Show. Take care, everyone. 